We're going to study together 2 Peter this morning, 2 Peter chapter 1. And uh, to start with, I want us to read the first five verses out loud. You know, the scripture says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're going to hear ourselves say the word of God out loud. So um, here we go. Verse one, this letter is from Simon Peter, a slave and apostle of Jesus Christ. I am writing to you who share the same precious faith we have. This faith was given to you because of the justice and fairness of Jesus Christ, our God and Savior. May God give you more and more grace and peace as you grow in your knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. Hold on, we're gonna say that one more time together. Say it again. By His divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know Him, the one who called us to Himself by means of His marvelous glory and excellence. And because of His glory and excellence, He has given us great and precious promises. These are the promises that enable you to share His divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. In view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Jesus, we invite you now to come and speak to us by the power of your Holy Spirit through your word. Lord, would you transform us by your word? Would you transform our thinking? Would you renew our minds? Would you soften our hearts? Would you make us more like yourself as we dive into your word to us today? And God, I pray you would anoint me, that you would give me your words and only your words to express. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. As much as possible, I try to follow Pastor Alex's uh, reading, scripture reading guidelines, you know, where he reads from the different sections of scripture. And, um, but, uh, you know, unfortunately, then it forces you into the books that are just a little harder to work through, like Ecclesiastes. And right now I'm in Ecclesiastes. And just this week, um, I was in chapter seven uh, and listened to how encouraging this word is. Better to spend your time at funerals than parties. Just let that sit. I'll just, I'll just let that sit with you for a minute. Better to spend your time at funerals than at parties. He continues, sadness has a refining influence on us. Okay, so that's actually true. It made me think about uh, just a couple weeks ago, I was at a retirement celebration. So not a funeral, but a retirement celebration for Pastor Harvey Drake, who pastored in the Rainier Valley for over 30 years. And he's retiring and his church was throwing him this dinner to honor them, both Andrea and Harvey, for their years, decades of ministry in a very tough area. And uh, as I was sitting there, Chris and I were sitting there in this dinner and listening to people come up and give tribute and talk about the impact of Pastor Harvey's ministry on their life. It does have this like refining nature. It, it kind of, when you sit and think about what someone's life represents at that stage, you can't help but think, Lord, what is my 
what, am, what is my life going to leave behind? What's the legacy I'm gonna leave behind? What will people say? I mean, one person said, I can't imagine Seattle without a Harvey Drake. And it was because he gave his life to justice in that community, to racial reconciliation, but also to righteousness in a way that cost him a lot of friendships and affiliations, even with other churches and pastors in that area. It was a sacrificial life. But at the end of it, you know, there was this like just honoring of his legacy. There's a way that funerals and and times like celebrating someone's ministry, it does, it distills things. It clarifies the vision, right? Like my aunt recently passed away, my aunt Madge, and at her memorial service, someone was saying that her last words over and over to her family that were next to her was, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He's coming soon. And it was like her life distilled into this one clarifying moment to pass on to her family. The most important truth, the most important truth, keep your eyes on Jesus, he's coming soon. And the same is true for Peter in 2 Peter. Peter finds himself at the end of his life. The Lord has shown him that it will be soon that he will be, he will be dying. He will be crucified. In fact, church tradition says that he refused to be crucified like Jesus. He didn't feel like he was worthy of it. Instead, he was crucified upside down. He felt and sensed from the Lord that this was coming. And in verse 14 of chapter one, he says, for our Lord Jesus Christ has shown me that I must soon leave this earthly life. So I will work hard to make sure you always remember, right? So here's the clarity. Here's the, let me distill down for you what is most important. I will work hard to make sure you always remember these things after I am gone. And we're gonna talk about these things in a minute. But he says, for we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes. He wants people to know, you might not have seen him, but I saw him and I'm about to go, but I want you to remember, I saw him with my own eyes and he's everything I'm telling you he is. He's as majestic and glorious as I'm telling you he is because I saw it with my own eyes. He says he heard the voice from the majestic glory of God say to Jesus, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. He says, we ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. We saw it and we heard it. It reminds me of the apostle John in 1 John. He says essentially the same thing. I saw him with my own eyes and he's light and there's no darkness in him. Like John wants you to know, you may not have had the privilege to see him, but I walked with him and talked with him and I watched him when people were looking and when people weren't looking. And he's who he says he is. He's light and there's no darkness. Peter says he's glorious, he's majestic, he's more than you could imagine. This is the, this is the cry of their heart that they want people to remember. I'm about to go, but I want you to remember, I've seen him and he's wonderful. I've seen him and he's glorious. I mean, it's like, have you ever seen someone from afar and you've admired them? You've thought they were wonderful, but you've never actually had one-on-one interaction. And then when you, act, when you finally do, you're maybe a little disappointed. They weren't quite what, who you thought they were, you know? But John and Peter are saying, no, he's who he said he is. He's who, we saw it, we saw it, we saw it. He's not like, I mean, we in Church Awakening, we try really hard to only bring in speakers that we know, and we know behind the scenes, they're consistent with who they are on a platform. There was one person we didn't do like due diligence with, and, and I started to get a clue because before this person came to speak at one of our conferences, I got a contract, and in the contract was like the degree that they wanted their latte, you know, prepared to sitting in the car waiting for them at the airport kind of thing. And it just gives you like an ick, like, oh, this person is not who I thought they were. You know, that's gross. We don't like that. But this is not, Peter and John are saying, we saw him. 
We saw him, we saw him. He's wonderful, he's glorious, he's, ev he's everything that we've told you he is and we've seen him with our own eyes. And because of that, we want you to know, we want you to know this, okay? Here's what Peter wants you to know. He wants you to know, verse three, that by Jesus's divine power, God has given you everything you need for godliness and for life. Yes, yes. Okay, I'm gonna say it again. By his divine power, by the power of Jesus, and power is translated force, violent force. So by the violent force of Jesus and his angelic host, he comes in to tell you, you have everything you need for godly life. Yes. Everything you need for life and godliness. Everything. Everything means everything. I looked it up. It's really easy. I checked the Greek meaning of everything, and it means all, everything, whole, everything. It just means everything. So if this is true, and you are a follower of Jesus, you have everything you need for life and to live a godly life. Everything you need for life and wholeness and virtue and goodness and healing and walking in strength, everything you need for life and godliness, you have. And yet, how many times do we not live in that reality? A lot. I'll speak for myself, a lot. I do not live in the reality that Jesus' divine power, the violent force of heaven, has given me everything I need. Do you, I mean, come on, you're not living like that either. I've seen you. I'm just kidding, sorry. <laughs> sorry, just trying to, you guys are staring at me. So, if you jump down to verse nine, which I don't, I don't think I have on the screen, but in verse nine, Peter says, it's possible to not live in this way. He says, those who fail to develop in this way are short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they've been cleansed from their own old sins. So it is possible for you to accept Jesus as your savior, plan eternity with him, but not live like he's given you everything you need for life and godliness. So the key for us is, okay, Peter, how do I live this way? How do I receive everything I need for life and godliness? Everything, everything I need for every practical need of your life and for every supernatural spiritual need of your life. Both equally part of everything. They were never meant to be separated. Paying your bills and casting out a demon, all part of everything. At the end of Mark, Jesus says, everyone who believes in me is gonna cast out demons. They're gonna heal the sick. So that's you. When was the last time you cast out a demon? He's given you everything you need for this. Uh-oh, okay, we gotta receive this. In the same way, you have everything you need to live a godly life that shows the world that you're at peace when they're in fear. Yeah. That you have freedom when they're bound up. Amen. In practical ways. Yeah. Equally part of everything. Everything. Okay, how do we do this? Well, Peter says, we receive this, all of it, we have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. Here it is. Jesus himself gives you a gift. And imagine this gift is labeled everything. Everything, everything, everything 
but it can sit right here and you never access it. And Peter says, you need to receive this. So you're going to need to come get it. And you know how to come get it? You need to put yourself in regular encounter with the one who is holy and worthy and magnificent and glorious and preeminent and high and lifted up and bigger than you and your problems. And when you put yourself in a regular encounter with Jesus, well, how do I do that? You just get where you can do that. And I'll tell you what, it is a rat race out there and that is not how you encounter Jesus. So you got to find places where you can quiet your spirit and your heart and you put your phone away and you stop trying to multitask and you just say, Jesus, I need you to reveal yourself to me. Do you think that's the will of heaven? Absolutely, 100%. You don't have to question that. And what does scripture say? When you ask according to his will, it will be done. So when you put yourself in the place of abandon before Jesus and you say, Jesus, I need to encounter you. I don't even know how to encounter your glory, but here I am. Would you encounter me? The Holy Spirit will rush in because he came, scripture says, to reveal Jesus to us and he will come with the revelation of God's glory. And when you are caught up in a regular encounter with Jesus, I don't mean one time 10 years ago, you had an awesome encounter in a revival meeting. I mean, every day you wake up and you invite Jesus to encounter you. Jesus, come encounter me before I go out and do anything. Reveal yourself to me. He'll do it in his word. He'll do it in worship. He'll do it in dreams when you are asleep. You need to start expecting him to encounter you. How did he encounter people in scripture? He showed up in burning bushes. He came in their dreams. He came in trances, angelic visions. When was the last time you had a trance? (laughs) Don't raise your hand, don't raise your hand. (laughs) But that's, that. listen, that should be as real in your life as real in your life as everything else, because these, this is part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, that he's encountering his people supernaturally. Yeah. And Peter's saying, will you come to know him? Because he's marvelously glorious. And you can't come up with that yourself. Your imagination can't even go there. But the Holy Spirit would love to reveal to you who Jesus is, how glorious he is, how wonderful he is. And when you are caught up in regular encounter with him, you find yourself confident that he has given you everything you need for life and godliness because you know who he is. When you need provision, you know he's provider because the Holy Spirit's revealed him as provider. When you need healing, you go to him because you know he's the healer. He's been revealed to me as healer. When you need help with parenting, you go to him because he's the father of all fathers. He knows your kids better than you know your kids. And I trust you, Jesus. You've revealed yourself. You fathered me. Show me how to parent my children. These are practical ways. God, I need to pay my bills. Lord, I'm gonna come to you because you're provider. Lord, you do miracles. Lord, you have done signs and wonders in scripture. I need some signs and wonders. You know who he is through regular encounter with Jesus. Start asking and expecting an encounter with Jesus. You can, you can very, there are certain places because of what's been sown in that you can expect to encounter. I believe our worship services, you should come in here expecting a revelation of Jesus. And you know what? It needs to be more regular than once a week. So you need to start developing that same pattern in other places of your life where you know, you know what? When I go on a hike, I encounter Jesus. I'm gonna go on hikes more often because I need to encounter Jesus. Or maybe you're somebody that you just need to put on soft worship music and just sit there and let the peace of God come over you and let God reveal himself to you. This needs to be what your life is about. This needs to be what you are dedicated to, that you would be someone who pursues encounter with the Lord above everything else. 
that I could be with Jesus and let him reveal himself to me. You need to start sleeping with a journal next to your bed because I think he wants to reveal himself to you through dreams. I think we, this is what God does with his people. He wants to show you things about how he works in dreams. And you won't remember if you don't, number one, expect that he's gonna speak to you in your dreams and two, have something to write it down. Have you ever tried to remember, you know you had a good dream and then you try to remember it and you can't remember it? God wants to speak to you in your dreams. Write it down, even if it doesn't make sense. Go back to it later. Ask, Jesus, was that just off? Was that just like what I ate? Was that weird? Or do you wanna talk to me about this? I had a dream recently that I was on the phone in my dream with Dutch Sheets. And Dutch Sheets was telling me he was getting ready to come here for a meeting. So I've invited him in the natural and he didn't, he said no. But <clears throat> you never know which part of this is real and which is uh, symbolic. But so I'm talking to him on the phone in my dream and he says, I'm coming tomorrow to preach. And, and while I'm talking to him, I know, and you know how you can do this in your dreams, you know, I know I'm scheduled to preach next though, like in minutes. I need to get off the phone and I look down and I don't have shoes on and my shoes are at home. So now I'm thinking, shoot, the last few minutes I was gonna try to prepare. I feel unprepared. Now I don't have shoes. And I woke up, I just journaled it. And then I was telling Chris about it and Chris is like, that means something. You need to ask the Lord what that means. Well, here's what I think it means. But I, I had to be willing to just write it out and go like, okay, Lord, you talk to me. I think Dutch sheets represents the move of God that's coming, right? You think about what his life is devoted to is praying that God would move in, in America, right? And re redeem America. I think, I think that's coming. I think we're, that's on the way. In the meantime, I didn't have my shoes on. What do shoes represent in scripture? It means the gospel. It means readiness. And I think the Lord was challenging me. You gotta be ready, Vanessa, in every season to preach the gospel. Are you ready? Are, your shoes aren't on. Get your shoes on. And... So I put, so I wrote it down and I said, Lord, I repent. I, I've got to be ready. You've got to help me be ready. Help me be ready. This is, Jesus wants to reveal himself to you. Start writing down your dreams and expecting that. Start paying attention to his word and how he's revealing you. Because as you pay attention, the more you encounter him, the more you will realize you have received everything you need for life and godliness. Okay, then I want to say this. There's a second piece to this. Encounter is the first piece. The second piece is that when he hands you everything, you have some expectations of what's in this box. Because when I hear everything I need for life and godliness, I imagine this box is filled with cash. <laughs> I mean, let's just be real. I imagine this box is full of a job promotion. It's full of perfect children. It's full of a happy everyday fairy tale marriage. It's, what else do you want out of your life? And that, that's what you think is in the box. It's what I think is in the box. When Jesus says to me, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness, I have some things I imagine are in this box. Okay. That's where we get in trouble. That's the second piece of why we don't pick up what Jesus has for us, the everything he has for us, is because he always wants to partner with his children. Much to my chagrin, I wish that in this box was a perfectly fit body with like a lot of muscle tone. And I've prayed about it. Don't tell me you have, you have totally prayed that Jesus would make you skinny. Because I, I am not the only one. Come on. If I was in a women's conference, I could get some yeses to that. Some yeses and amen. Jesus, make me skinny. I can only blame the baby weight for so long, you know? My kids are now fully outside of that window. I cannot blame ba baby weight. I have to blame myself. But I want Jesus to fix it overnight. Guess what? In this box is not a fully toned, skinny body. What is in this box is something that doesn't look that nice, but it's wisdom. And it's wisdom from the Lord and his invitation for me to partner with him 
in something that he wants to put his divine power on. He wants to put miraculous, not expected, no one else could expect these results, but I have to partner with the wisdom of heaven to receive everything I need for life and godliness. Look at what Peter says here. In in verse five, Peter says, in view of all this, every great and precious promise he's given you, everything he's given you that you need for life and godliness, you need to make every effort to respond to God's promises. That looks like wisdom. And here's what I mean by wisdom. I don't mean um, like knowing the perfect thing to do in the, every time, having good strategies at work, uh, knowing how to organize your pantry well. Like these are not, that's not wisdom. What wisdom is, is knowing God's heart and strategies knowing God's heart and strategies, and then having the faith to partner with what he's doing. That's wisdom. It doesn't look like man's wisdom, okay? It's not, it is not a list, it's not a formula that we can follow like man does. We love, human, humans love to have lists. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. And then on the other side of this, I'll look like this, I'll sound like this, I'll have this perfect life. We love that. That's not God's wisdom. God's wisdom is, will you encounter me, love me so much, know how wonderful I am, that you'll do whatever I ask to partner with me to see miracles released in your life. Like, let's just give some examples. There's so many scriptural examples of this. Jesus, help me think of just the right ones for this. But like, okay, so, so think about Moses. The Israelites are going into some of their first battles and Joshua's leading the battle. God promises that they're gonna have victory, that this land is theirs. Yes, he's already promised it. It's his great promise. So it would be very normal. This is how a lot of us handle God's promises. God wants victory in my life. He said, this is my land. So I'm gonna sit down and expect it to happen. No, God says, make every effort to partner with my promises. Moses, go on top of the mountain and hold up your staff. And Moses has to do something that's ridiculous. Did that staff win the battle? No, of course not. But his willingness to partner with the wisdom of heaven, holding out the staff, causes a miracle to take place in the battlefield and victory, the promise is accomplished. What else? How many, okay, let's talk about Naaman. Naaman comes, he needs a miracle. His body is covered in leprosy. So he comes to the prophet and says, I need healing. Is God our healer? Yes. Can God do miraculous healing in our body? Yes. He wants you to partner with this promise. And he says to Naaman, go to the Jordan River and dip seven times. And Naaman says, no thanks, that's an ugly rock. Right? He says, I don't, why do I need to go to the Jordan River? That's disgusting. And the prophet says, if you want healing, you gotta partner and make every effort to partner with God's wisdom. And then you'll see the miracle. So Naaman goes and he dips seven times. And did he receive his miracle? Yes, he received his miracle. But there was an effort made on his part. He had to humble himself and partner with the promise of God. And it often will be a humbling strategy because you will get no credit for it. It'll be you, like, okay, let's just, I'm gonna use these dumb examples. Please don't get caught up on my dumb examples. But like this whole weight thing for me, I, you know, you just go like, come on, I got to lose weight. And um, I know I just keep eating. So I'm not sure why, like, it's not working. But, but Chris helped me and encouraged me. I got a gym membership. Okay. I'm partnering with some promises here. And I go twice a week, which is not a ton. You probably can't even tell. That's okay. But I go twice a week. And in that class, I look like an utter fool. 
I don't know what I'm doing. This class, they have you do stuff I would never imagine doing to get in shape. But they think of ways to make you look like a fool in front of these, come on women, I'm just gonna talk to you for a minute. You guys know the yoga mamas who wear the yoga pants and they're so cute and they look like they've done nothing but yoga all day long. And then they walk in this gym class like freshly and I'm just like huffing and puffing, like not pretty. And it's embarrassing. I'm trying not to just fall over, but you know what? I'm getting stronger. And I am building muscle tone. I'm, I, I can actually tell because I'm not getting migraines the same way I used to because I'm stronger now. And this is a silly example, but God works in the practical. It's just like, that's practical. I needed help. And God's helping me with a lot of things right now, but I'm having to partner with him on this. And in the same way, we have to say, okay, what are, God might ask us to do some humbling things, to partner with his promise, to receive the fullness of the everything you need for life and godliness. Because if he made me skinny overnight, I'd be fat again in six months. Why? Because I haven't established self-discipline. I haven't established exercise routines. He wants this for the long haul. God's in this for the long haul. He's not always just looking for instantaneous. Can he do instantaneous? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he wants us for the long haul. So he's like, will you partner with me? Here's what I want you to do first. Look, it turned out bad for the rich young ruler. Think about that story. He goes to Jesus and he says, I want eternal life. And Jesus says, okay, sell everything you have. And he goes, yeah, no thanks. Uh, That's okay. And he walks away. It's possible. And he missed out completely because he wasn't, he didn't, he didn't know how good Jesus is. If you knew how wonderful he is, you'd go like, well, this looks like a rock, but I'll I'll do whatever you say. I'll pick it up, okay? You need a miracle in in your finances. There is no formula that's gonna get you out despite, again, like, I'm sorry, but like Dave Ramsey, he cannot get you out of your mess. He has some good ideas, but look at me, only God can give you what you need for your finances. And for some of you, the Lord's gonna look at you like he did the rich young ruler and he's gonna say, I know you need provision right now. So I'm gonna ask you to give. Give to this young family over here. Buy them presents at Christmas. And out of that generosity, it doesn't look like anything. It doesn't look like it should accomplish anything. It's the staff held over the battle. And yet, because you've been willing to pick up the rock and do the hard thing and trust the Lord with what doesn't look like it makes sense, he's gonna rush in with provision over your life. But then there's others of you, you need provision and God's gonna tell you to just take more hours at work. He might do that too. I, I would love to say it's gonna be a box of cash. That's what I want. I want a savings account with millions of dollars that I can rely on. He has never done that for me. <laughs> Instead, little things. When we need, when tuition goes up every year, we just go like, Jesus, I, I'm just gonna trust you. And you know what? He gives us practical things, more hours to work. It never looks like checks in the mail. I I want it to, but instead he says, hey, do this. Refinance your house, pay off your car. That money can go towards your kids. It's stuff like that. It's the wisdom of God. And he says, will you pick up the rock? And then every once in a while, he's just gonna throw a miracle in your life that you are totally unexpected, but you're gonna have the character to hold on to that miracle, right? What do they say about lottery winners? Like they're so miserable afterwards because they don't have the character to deal with what they've been given. God's developing in you character. He says, I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. So receive it by knowing me. Receive it by knowing me and then make every effort to partner with the promises of God. He wants to show you He wants to give you strategy and insight. He has things at your job. You feel like you're struggling. What do you need? What do you need at your job? Strategies, wisdom, he's got it for you. Start start bringing that stuff into your encounter with him. Start asking him to speak to you about the things that are practical in your life, the places you need help. Start laying before him with those things and ask him to speak to you. He will give you strategies. And sometimes those strategies will be like, hey, actually, that is not what I'm focused on right now. So you need to let go. And that does happen. 
It's happened for me. I've brought things in. I've been like, Lord, this is a really big problem. It's a really, really big problem. And the Lord said, I'm not solving that problem right now. And I have to be willing to lay it down and walk away and trust. He's so good. I trust him that if he's not worried about solving that problem, I shouldn't be worried about solving that problem because he's given me everything I need for life and godliness. Okay, I'm gonna have you stand with me. You come and I want you to lead us. And It's like I can feel Peter, just his heart cry, is if you knew how wonderful he is, if you knew how wonderful he is, if you knew how wonderful he is. Look, he has a strategy for you. Some of you right now, you are trapped in sin and addiction. It's very hidden. You've kept it very hidden. And you've convinced yourself that that is something you will always have to struggle with. I wanna say to you right now, shout it from the mountaintops, God has given you everything you need for life and godliness. That addiction is part of everything. He is going to give you deliverance. Now look at me, it may not be overnight. You may have to partner with his wisdom. You may have to humble yourself and get help. You may have to go tell somebody. You may need to go to Monday night, new heart, and you're saying to yourself, I don't really wanna have to do that. Well, are you willing to make every effort? God's got deliverance for you. Will you make every effort? to partner with his deliverance in your life. This applies to every area of your life. If there's anything right now that you're saying, yeah, but, then look, scripture says, we tear down anything that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. If the gospel can't work in every context, under every situation, it doesn't work. God has so many resources right now that as Americans, we live with so many resources. If every one of those was stripped away, he would still give you everything you need for life and godliness. There is no challenge you're facing. There is no hardship you're going through. There is no loss that you've experienced where you can say, I guess this doesn't fit. It fits, it fits, it fits. He has given you everything you need for life and godliness. There's no surprises to him. What he's asking for you, look, this is how you respond. If you're in a spot where you would say, I need everything. I need him to provide for me. I need him to bring wisdom for me. I need his healing power. I need his deliverance. I need him to save my marriage. Ask for his encounter. Ask him to just start encountering you like never before. Make space for it. Make every effort to encounter Jesus. And then be ready when he talks to you to partner with his wisdom over your life. And I promise you, you're gonna see miracles like you've never seen miracles. You're gonna see signs and wonders in your life like you've never seen signs and wonders. You need need this kind of wisdom even to know who to pray for, how to pray, where to see miracles, when to put mud on someone's eyes and when to, this is all what we're supposed to do is be so tuned in to God that we're ready to partner with whatever he asks us to do so we can see him do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ask or imagine in our lives. I'm gonna ask Chris to sing. And as he sings, I want you to bring whatever it is that you would say, and I need to pick up the gift. I need to pick up and receive everything. This altar area is open for you. And I know sometimes we'll say things like, this isn't special, but it is special actually. And it's special because spiritually there's something that's been sown in this physical space for decades. People have prayed over this. They've wept over this. They've anointed this. People have encountered the Lord here over and over and over. So this essentially is like a thin place. And if you'll come and you'll bring that thing that's heavy on your heart right now, you'll bring that thing that you're not quite sure he has everything. Bring it and lay it down and ask him right now for a revelation of Jesus. That's where you start. 
Jesus, I need a revelation of you. And then listen and expect that he's gonna give you the wisdom of God and how you're gonna walk out of here with his strategy and his heart and the divine power, the force, the violent force of all the angelic hosts of heaven to accomplish God's purposes in your life.